This is Dr. Al Hewer of a and Lectures, and I want to welcome you to another of our online CEU lectures. This particular one focuses on delivering on the National Patient Safety Goals, or NPSGs. And this lecture will not just review the evolution, the current state of affairs in National Patient Safety Goals, but we'll particularly focus on some of the changes or updates which have occurred in the past few years. I want to welcome you to today's lecture. We hope that you learn something from it and we hope that you come back for either our live lectures and or more of these online lectures which we'll be delivering. Thank you very much and have a real good day. Today's learning objectives will include a review of the healthcare quality landscape in the United States. We will then take a closer look at the Joint Commission and in particular their national patient safety goals. This will include a review of the history and evolution of the NPSGs or the national patient safety goals. From then we will move on to describing some of the recent updates to the national patient safety goals. We'll review progress which has or in some cases has not been made, including specific measures to address such goals. Then we'll move on to reviewing other safety organizations and strategies that are used in the American healthcare system. And lastly, and probably most importantly, I'll then furnish you with additional resources for those who wish to drill down further on these topics. To some, this slide speaks for itself. That is, that the healthcare landscape is complex. Indeed, this industry is perhaps one of the most complex in the world. With that, it makes optimizing safety, in particular patient safety, as complex as any industry that's out there. In the presence of this complex environment, the national patient safety goals are intended to be one of the main tools and strategies in order to help maximize patient safety. The American healthcare system is both complex and unique in another very special way. That is, with regard to the number of organizations that are committed to improvement as well as patient safety. Among them are public organizations and governmental agencies such as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services, or CMS, the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, also known as ARC. There are private organizations and non-governmental ones, such as the Joint Commission. Some actually believe that the Joint Commission is a governmental agency. Indeed, it's not. It is a private not-for-profit organization that was actually created in the early 1950s to oversee healthcare quality. In addition, there's provider organizations such as hospital systems that band together in order to, if you will, focus on quality and solve the challenges that exist. The Institute of Medicine, or the IOM. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And lastly among them is the LeapFrog Group, which is a consortium of private healthcare consumers on the corporate level, such as your IBMs, ExxonMobil, and other rather large organizations in the United States. In addition, there's combined efforts that look at a combination of public and private. And amongst these is a consortium known as the Partnership for Patients. Together, these organizations formulate the oversight umbrella that is responsible for helping ensure healthcare quality and patient safety in the United States. This slide builds on the prior one and really shows you the relationship between or amongst the organizations that oversee patient safety and quality in the United States. So for example, you have the Joint Commission and CMS, or the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services. 
they are separate organizations. But in fact, CMS has deemed the Joint Commission to have what's called statutory authority in that CMS actually recognizes the Joint Commission and their accreditation process in the process of reimbursement from CMS in that to participate in many reimbursement programs offered by CMS, hospitals and other healthcare organizations need to be accredited by the Joint Commission or by another recognized organization. There is also some less formal relationship between organizations such as the Leapfrog Group or corporate consumers and the Joint Commission and CMS in that these corporate consumers who are part of the Leapfrog Group look to the Joint Commission to ensure that they've accredited or at least have surveyed these organizations with which the Leapfrog Group has a relationship and that there's no issues with regard to CMS from the uh, providers that are providing care for Leapfrog Group corporations. The organization at which we're going to be focusing on today most closely is the Joint Commission. I alluded to earlier, the Joint Commission is a private not-for-profit organization that was founded in the early 1950s. The focus of the Joint Commission is to survey and accredit hospitals and other healthcare organizations in the United States. Interestingly enough, other countries have actually modeled a Joint Commission-like survey process in their healthcare systems as well. Currently, the Joint Commission accredits about 90% of healthcare organizations in the United States, most notably hospitals, but other organizations as well, such as home care agencies, clinics, and other outpatient facilities. Quality initiatives that they focus on are survey standards, and about half of them target patient safety, not surprisingly. They actually have what's called the Sentinel Event Policy, which targets, if you will, unexpected occurrences involving death or serious injury, which really is a major excerpt from the definition of a Sentinel Event. Regarding Sentinel Events, reporting is encouraged. RCA, or Root Cause Analysis, are strongly encouraged to be done to, in order to determine the root cause of the problem and to develop an action plan to remediate the situation and help prevent recurrences. An outgrowth in the Joint Commission process has been the National Patient Safety Goals and the uh, accompanying tracers for surveys, where they will actually trace a patient from the time they are admitted to a hospital or other facility through the process and as they're discharged. The National Patient Safety Goals actually act as a framework in the tracers for helping ensure that these goals were kept in mind as the patient was transitioned through the process of care. While the Joint Commission has been around since the early 1950s, the National Patient Safety Goals aren't as old. They were actually established in 2002 to help accredited organizations address specific problem areas with regard to patient safety. The first set of national patient safety goals was effective in very early 2003. The Patient Safety Advisory Group advises the Joint Commission on the development and, as important, the updating of the national patient safety goals. Before we get into the goals themselves, there's a few key points regarding the national patient safety goals that I'd like to stress. Firstly, they are site specific. For example, there are specific national patient safety goals that relate to an ambulatory setting versus one in behavioral health, as opposed to one in home care, hospitals, lab services, etc. In total, there are 15 goals, and there are actually sub goals within each of them. For example, goal one is to improve the accuracy of patient identification. Goal two, effectiveness of communication and optimizing it. Goal three, improving medication safety 
and so on. In the next several slides, we will drill down on several of these goals, as well as updates to them which have occurred in the recent past. The first national patient safety goal is focused on patient identification. And in general, it aims to improve the accuracy of patient identification. Now, more recently, one of the areas that's been focused on in particular are transfusion errors, where misidentification of the patient has in fact resulted in sentinel events and other major problems. As a result of this and of the original foundation for this goal, there's recommended actions. One of the original actions that was recommended was to use at least two patient identifiers when providing care, treatment, and services. The update is that there's two distinct methods that have been used, but more particularly, there's two patient populations or two situations where patient identification needs to be considered in a more unique light. For example, newborn infants. They recommend the mother's first and last names and the newborn's gender be used to identify the infant. Another special focus is with high risk procedures as I alluded to previously, for example, blood transfusions. Before administering the blood or related products, use two-person verification or a one-person plus an automated identification method such as barcoding. Current status on this looks to be pretty good. Bar scanning is very widely used and has been noted to have caught some potentially serious medication errors. Despite this, however, challenges persist, especially for special patient populations. Goal two is focused on improving communication. It actually indicates that we should improve the effectiveness of communication among caregivers. In particular, we should report critical results of tests and diagnostic procedures in or on a timely time frame or basis. The update, more recently, recommends the development of written procedures for managing critical test results that address the following. So for example, for a, a result of an ABG uh, that has a critical result such as a severe respiratory metabolic acidosis, a chest x-ray that's revealing a pneumothorax or some other very serious condition. The definition of the critical results of the tests and procedures need to be clearly espoused. What also needs to be clear is by whom and to whom the critical test results should be reported. In the case of an arterial blood gas, the respiratory therapist should, for example, report it very promptly to both the prescribing physician as well as the nurse. And there should be an acceptable length of time between the availability of the test results and the reporting. Obviously, the more abnormal the test results, the quicker the reporting should take place. In general, it looks like the status on this particular focus is pretty good. It looks like we've made some significant progress over the past several years. For example, reporting and recording of critical results has been enhanced by digital SBARs incorporated into the electronic health record systems, such as those offered by Epic and Cerner. In addition, the use of interprofessional rounding, particularly in the intensive care units, has become much more commonplace and has improved interprofessional communication. This next slide relates to medication safety. Medication safety has actually been one of the original national patient safety goals. However, one of the major updates relates to the influx of generic medications and the challenges that are being posed. For example, the non-standard packaging from multiple producers and a related point of the lack of familiarity by the clinicians with the packaging and manufacturing information and the like. Some of the original 
initiatives related to medication safety speak to labeling all medications, including medication containers and other solutions, whether they're on or off the sterile field, in a perioperative and other procedural settings. Also aiming to reduce the likelihood of patient harm associated with the use of anticoagulant therapy. Now, while this has been always one of the initiatives, it has become a specially concerning issue as of late. And one of the other recommendations regarding medication safety is labeling meds which are not labeled. For example, for respiratory therapists and pulmonologists, before bronchoscopy and the syringes have been drawn up with mucamist, epinephrine, normal saline, etc., all of those syringes should be labeled well in advance. Next slide builds on the prior one related to medication safety. And that labeling that we previously spoke of should include the medication, the strength, the dose, the date opened. Another major initiative for medication safety with regard to the national patient safety goals has been to protect patients from what you, what's called free flow for IVs. And that is an IV that is inadvertently allowed to run into the patient resulting in an overdose. This is particularly important for medications that have what's called a narrow therapeutic index. So your medications that, if you will, can be very harmful if the patient is overdosed on them. For example, opiates, chemotherapy medications, blood pressure medications, and many medications that are used in the ICU setting. What's also recommended is to actually focus on food and drug interactions for patients receiving warfarin and whether those medications be FDA approved or even, if you will, substances that are used in alternative medicine such as herbal remedies. We still struggle with identifying what, if you will, unit those medications are, particularly once they've been removed from the packaging. And the overall grading in this area is probably in the fair range, C to C+. Plus. So some progress has been made, in part due to digital identification systems. Generic medication influxes still pose potential challenges, so there's still much room for improvement. National Patient Safety Goal number six speaks to ensuring medical equipment alarms are functional, properly set, and responded to in a timely fashion. Among the equipment that's included are ventilators, monitors that are used for overseeing patients' clinical status in an ICU, apnea monitors, and tidal CO2 monitoring devices, and similar monitoring equipment regularly testing and documenting that the alarms are fully functional. Also ensuring that the alarms properly interface as designed. So for example, if the alarm or equipment are interfaced with a remote module, the alarm should be tested and ensured that when an alarm threshold is reached, that it in fact alarms at the remote module. Equipment with malfunctioning alarms should be tagged and removed. If possible, that equipment should be repaired by properly trained and credentialed individuals. When it cannot be repaired, it should be permanently removed from service. Implementing an improvement plan if there's a problem is another foundational principle of this goal. It could include if there's a problem with a patient or a caregiver in a home care environment, if you will, disabling a ventilator alarm, there should be an improvement plan that involves educating the caregiver and following up with the patient and the caregiver to ensure that they comply with the plan moving forward. One of the updates that's occurred more recently is the phenomenon of alarm fatigue. So for example, we now know that excessive alarms can do at least two things. They can, number one, desensitize 
the clinician from responding to alarms. The second thing that can happen is that individuals can actually become excessively stressed from the excessive alarms. So caregivers and clinicians alike who are exposed to excessive alarms can actually be overly stressed as a result of this. So consequently, the appropriately but not overly sensitive alarm parameters need to be put in place. Goal 7 speaks to reducing the risk of healthcare associated infections. And one of the foundational building blocks associated with meeting this goal continues to be hand hygiene guidelines. Proper hand washing, use of anti-infective gels, and related activities. There's also an initiative to implement evidence-based practices to prevent healthcare associated infections. So really continuing to review the literature and make modifications to the actual bedside practice that reflect any new developments. Again, hand hygiene is one of the cornerstones, but one of the updates that has occurred in the past few years is educating the staff and licensed independent practitioners such as physician assistants and nurse practitioners who are involved in managing central lines and basically trying to use evidence-based protocols to minimize bloodstream infection risks that are associated with them. The use of antiseptic or skin preparations during central venous catheter insertion is one such measure. Another update is conducting periodic risk assessments in time frames that are evidence-based but are also practical in the context of the hospital environment. And one of the main focal points is multi-drug resistant organism transmission and helping prevent or absolutely minimize that. Here again, current status is perhaps fair to good. So in that C plus B minus range, hand hygiene compliance has improved. In fact, respiratory therapists and nurses tend to rank near the top of the scale regarding compliance in that 90 to 95 percent range. And guess who is not as compliant? That is, you'd find that many physicians, particularly resident physicians that are training, tend to be less compliant. Our success, if you will, with central line related and multi-drug resistant infections has, if you will, improved, but issues persist. Continuing with goal number seven, that is reducing the risk of healthcare associated infections. Implementing evidence-based practices to prevent indwelling catheter associated urinary tract infections or CAUTES. So we know that these catheter associated urinary tract infections have been an issue for some period of time and they're a major source of infection and in some cases sepsis in our hospitalized patients. So along these lines, some of the recommended actions, the rapid removal of the urinary tract catheters. One of the recent changes that we've actually seen is a very significant increase in the use of non-invasive urine collection systems. One such collection system is known as the PureWIC, non-invasive urine collection system. Another aspect of this is educating on aseptic techniques for the removal and insertion of these sorts of catheters and other catheters, especially in non-acute settings such as rehab and home care. The judicious, meaning very regulated use and removal of such catheters. The current status, basically urinary tract infections or UTIs are still quite troubling. Hence, the jury's out. Our rating is probably in that C, C plus B minus range. But again, like some of the other areas, there's still much work to be done. Goal number nine, relating to reducing patient risks for falls continues to be the focus of national patient safety goals. Reducing the risk of patient harm from falls 
and taking recommended actions to do so. If they occur, incident reports should be filled out and a concurrent root cause analysis should be done in order to determine what factors contributed to the occurrence and as important, preventative measures such as early identification of high-risk patients, earmarking such patients with a bracelet, a label on their medical record, perhaps even some sort of a notation on the, at the head of their bed or on their door jam. Interventions such as restraints, arm cushions, the use of sitters and spotters should also be strongly considered. Clinician re-education relating to bed rails, such as bed rails were put down to do an arterial blood gas, they should be put back up immediately following that procedure. The current status, like some of the others, is fair. We've seen some reduction in fall rates, but one fall is one too many, and there's still too many patients who are suffering such events. In the interest of time and the somewhat limited scope of this presentation, we're skipping ahead to National Patient Safety Goal 14, which talks to preventing health care associated pressure ulcers. And one of the issues that needs to be considered is assessing and periodically reassessing each resident or patient's risk for developing a pressure ulcer and taking action to address any which have occurred and taking selected recommended actions, including identifying high-risk patients. That sounds familiar because that's the key to, if you will, meeting several of the national patient safety goals. And in particular, with pressure ulcers, immobilized patients are a particularly high-risk group. Using rotating beds, repositioning patients every two hours, inspecting and assessing all patients, especially new ones. And one of the relatively recent updates is more fully implementing early mobility protocols. So there's a saying that sitting up is better than laying down. Sitting is better than laying down. Standing is better than sitting. Walking is better than standing, etc., etc. You get the point. And many of these early mobility patient protocols are based on this fundamental principle. There's other methods that are used, including those that involve prophylaxis or preventative measures. Using duoderm or specialized cushions on high risk areas, such as the buttocks. Using gel patches or similar devices on the bridge of the nose for areas that are prone to BiPAP interface skin breakdown and other similar measures. Despite what this slide indicates, there really is no such thing as a typical pressure ulcer. However, the unfortunate reality is many times they do occur in the buttocks or the sacral area of the lower back. And essentially, all pressure ulcers can be staged from stage one where the skin is discolored, but it's not broken. So understand that the breakdown can actually occur beneath the skin before the skin itself is broken. All the way to a stage four, where the ulcer extends to the muscle and sometimes to the bone. Over about the past decade, sores such as those that can occur at the bridge of the nose or the cheeks from BiPAP interface or around the ears from nasal cannulas were not categorized as, if you will, preventable. Well, now they are. And they have been, again, for about a decade. The troubling part is that this problem persists, is that too many patients who are on continuous BiPAP for, let's say, not just hours, but several days at a time can develop these sores. And as a result, many hospitals and other healthcare organizations have reverted to using interfaces such as nasal pillows or certain types of gel masks that are kinder and gentler to the skin. In the case of nasal cannulas, sometimes there's foam that can go around the actual tubing around the ears that can help prevent 
skin breakdown. So we've made some progress in this area, but there's still some troubling aspects that need to be addressed. National Patient Safety Goal number 15 relates to identifying safety risks inherent in certain specific patient populations. In particular, looking at condition-specific risks. For example, in a burn center, considering infection and thermal control risks. In oncology, also considering infection, but in addition, treatment side effects and of course, and most unfortunately, the potential for reoccurrence of the disease. In a psychiatric setting, suicide and elopement are risks. By elopement, we don't mean going to Vegas and getting hooked up. We are referring to patients that simply go missing. It may be a child. It may be an elderly patient who has dementia. It may be a patient who's in a psychiatric center. Circling back to suicide prevention, one of the updates that's been focused on only over the past few years is conducting a risk assessment that identifies specific patient characteristics and environmental factors that impact the risk specifically for suicide. So looking at patients who are perhaps idealizing suicide or show other major risk factors and taking specific measures to help address the risk and reduce it. On a related point, when a patient at risk for suicide leaves the care of a hospital or an acute care setting, they should be provided with suicide prevention information and it's strongly encouraged that they be followed up with to ensure that they have sought such assistance. In home care, the risk may relate to medication administration ventilator use, oxygen use, or other similar equipment. And likewise, a plan should be in place in order to minimize the risks that are associated with such equipment and or medical conditions. Notable progress has been made in identifying and mitigating safety risks inherent in specific patient populations. For example, in a burn center setting, there have been some positive results in reducing post-burn complications and mortality. In the oncology arena, we've also seen some positive trends with regard to complications secondary to chemotherapy, depending upon the type of cancer and, of course, depending upon the type of treatment regimen. In a psychiatric setting, the results have been favorable, but not necessarily as good. So some progress has been made, but special populations, particularly those at risk for suicide, remain at risk and there's been some troubling trends. In alternate or alternative sites, some improvements been made, but there still remains work to be done with patients that are on special equipment, such as those that have what's called left ventricular assist devices that assist the left side of the heart in pumping blood. And this is highly specialized equipment. It's life-sustaining equipment. And if something goes wrong from it, or if the patient develops an infection secondary to what's called the drive line, which is the main line that goes from the equipment outside of the body to the actual LVAD or left ventricular assist device itself, it can be very problematic and potentially life-threatening. Similar concerns exist with home oxygen, apnea monitors, as well as ventilators, as we elaborated on earlier. This slide illustrates how cigarettes and oxygen do not mix. So home care nurses and respiratory therapists are trained to educate the family, the patient, the caregivers on the hazards of home oxygen particularly where there's open flames and or smoking going on. The two simply don't mix and very bad things can happen when they do. A fundamental principle inherent in the National Patient Safety Goals is the universal protocol for preventing wrong site, wrong procedure, wrong person surgery. The update on this goes like this. 
The prevailing opinion is that wrong site surgery should simply never happen. Despite this, it continues to be an ongoing problem. Hence, some of the recommendations are to conduct a pre-procedure verification process, to actually physically mark the procedure site. In this case, one of the updates is that the procedure site is marked by a licensed independent practitioner, again, such as a physician, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner who is accountable for the procedure and will be present during the procedure. A timeout is performed before the procedure to ensure that it is the correct patient, the correct site, the correct procedure. Another update is that a written alternative process be in place for patients who refuse site markings or when it is technically or anatomically impossible, such as surgery through a natural orifice, such as treatment involving teeth, and other similar procedures. The current status is fair to good. There's been some progress. Use of pre-procedure timeouts have been in place. How many of us have observed timeouts, perhaps before a thoracentesis, a bronchoscopy, endoscopy, or other procedure we've borne witness to? Probably fairly common that, that we've seen the timeout take place and again, it is one of the fundamental principles of preventing these sorts of occurrences. There's much more information that's available on the Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals. One of those sites is going to the Joint Commission's website directly at www.jointcommission.org. And believe it or not, questions can be sent to the Standards Interpretation Group. Their phone number is 630-792-5900 or there's actually a standards online question submission form that can be used to also do so. In addition to the Joint Commission and their National Patient Safety Goals, there are other organizations which support patient safety and the National Patient Safety Goals. One of them, perhaps the major one, is CMS or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services who has partnered with and granted statutory authority to the Joint Commission. What that really translates into is for certain programs offered by CMS, providers need to be accredited by the Joint Commission or another accrediting agency which is recognized by CMS. CMS also releases Medicare physician outcomes data, which really allows the comparison of physicians with regard to how well they're doing as far as outcomes such as mortality, morbidity, complications, adverse outcomes, and the like. CMS More for Consumer offers the Hospital Compare tool. This tool basically allows us as consumers to compare Hospital A and Hospital B, up to a maximum of three hospitals. Another organization focused on supporting patient safety is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC. They happen to fund much of the research which supports the national patient safety goals and other patient safety strategies. One of these strategies or tools is the Patient Safety Culture Survey, which allows organizations to survey their staff to get their input as to how oriented to patient safety their culture is. This survey has been validated, meaning it measures what it's intended to. It tends to be a good reflection of the culture of safety within a healthcare organization. And they publish many, many other tools, including the steps to a safer healthcare, which is really geared more towards consumers also, but it can also offer some insight to institutional providers of healthcare. To drill down a little bit more on the prior slide, the Agency on Healthcare Research and Quality has a lot to say about creating a culture of safety. In addition to their survey, 
they speak to how the survey should be conducted and how it should involve all staff in patient safety, ranging from the cleaning people all the way up to bedside clinicians, including respiratory therapists, nurses, physicians, physical therapists, and other similar clinicians. They talk about holding patient focus groups to help ensure multiple stakeholder input, and they talk to organizational leadership making patient safety rounds, getting out there, what's called in the business books, management by walking around. And lastly, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, ARC talks about five steps to safer healthcare quality. Those steps including asking questions, keeping and bringing in a list of all medications you take, getting the results of any and all tests and procedures that you have done, talking to your doctor about which hospital is best, given your specific needs, and making sure you understand what will happen if you will need surgery. As we wind down this presentation, we really want you to keep in mind that while there's a lot of traditional means to help ensure patient safety, there's also a few less traditional ones that we don't necessarily recommend, but can be resorted to when all else fails. As we conclude this presentation, we want to provide you with additional selected references in case you wish to drill down more on any of these topics that we've talked about today. Most importantly, we want to thank you very much for attending this lecture. We hope you've learned something from doing so, and we also hope that you will return to a and Lectures, whether it's for our in-person or live presentations or more of these online presentations that we'll be doing. Thank you and have a great day.